innovation and cultural diversity are interconnected and for both to be effective we should consider strongly adding it to our breakfast diet because after all as we all know innovation breeds creativity invention and spurs the progress of curiosity of a large assortment of different people. Adopting a nimble approach to the prospect of innovation is the best way to go because, my friends, after all, we all know that we live in a changing landscape and a news cycle that runs 24 hours. So if we can get ahead of the game of innovation, we can create a tangible, competitive advantage for our business, our life, and our societal understanding of progress at large. Colin Duff affectionately refers to himself as an innovation fire starter. He is all about innovation and moving the needle of innovative progress forward. He's the CEO and founder of Mosaic Innovation, a consultancy which helps leading enterprises such as HP, Marriott, and BT crack through their growth challenges, build capability, and transform their culture. As a leader, have I piqued your level of curiosity and inquisitive interest? Well, if you answered yes, I'm glad you found some time in your schedule to stop by the program to hear what Duff has to say about innovation, creativity, and thinking forward, because without further delay, my conversation with Duff starts now. I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. I'll take a moment to welcome you to the program, and I'm super excited to talk to you all about innovation today. Great to see you, and thank you so very much for being here. Yeah, delighted to be here. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. So, Colin, I, I'm fascinated by the work that you do, my friend. I'm wondering if you could tell me exactly what an innovative uh, in, in innovation and cultural consultant really does and uh, what is the most fascinating part of your work my friend sure so it's one of those jobs when you're at school the careers advisor never mentioned so i hadn't heard of it either but really what we focus on on the innovation consultancy is helping in our case big businesses come up with new ideas for products services and experiences and we help them do it during those early stages in terms of finding insight, uh, developing concepts, and then usually running some kind of test and, or experimentation to see if these things um, actually work. And then they go away and, and scale them and implement them. And on the related side, you talk about cultural transformation. So that really came about in my case because these organizations were asking, how do we get our people to be a bit more like your people? So to be more entrepreneurial, to care a bit more about the customer rather than just the spreadsheets. And we've done a lot of work there in terms of any stuff around winning hearts and minds, whether that be things like training, whether that be trying to help these organizations have more human friendly processes, because a lot of them 
it's the horrible bureaucracy that just crushes the human spirit or I'm just helping people as well be a bit more ingen ingenuitive as well or to learn new skills so it really our, our anchor is always around innovation but sometimes it's us solving a problem or sometimes it's us helping the company to solve a problem more effectively so that's it very simply but happy to tell you in a lot more detail or give you lots of examples of some of the fun and maybe less fun stuff we've worked on yeah let's do that right now i know that you're the ceo and, and founder of mosaic innovation which has worked with some of the leading uh, companies as a consultancy and working with them to sort of cra crack through the, their growth challenges and build uh, capacity and uh, uh, capability and transform the way they do business. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole concept. I'm wondering if you can tell me all about it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did some work with a big telecom company and they wanted to help people with cyber security. And the big challenge you have there is if you ask people about cyber security, everyone will tell you it's really important and they're very worried. The reality is very few people actually do anything about it. And I don't know if you've got all the virus checking and anti-scam stuff in place. Maybe you do, but most people don't. So we're trying to figure out how do you actually get people engaged with this product? And we use this really cool method called the design sprint. And put really simply, it's you get a bunch of people in a room for a week. You kind of lock the door. And then you bring in lots of experts and um, examples from other industries as, as stimulus. And you just generate lots of ideas to solve it. And we built this really cool product. And it's going back a few years now when this was really new. But the idea was that by simply entering your email, we could tell people if your email has been breached. And what you found is most people actually, their email has been breached. So it only takes 60 seconds. And this was for customers or non-customers. And then we just take you through a really simple process of here's probably some of the stuff you should do to respond to it. So this was a new digital service. And then we'd also try and promote things like VPN, so virtual private network, but in a really simple way that even your granny or your granddad, I don't want to stereotype old people, that they could understand. So super simple language, um, all integrated in one area. And we managed to drive subsequently tens of thousands of people to sign up for this product that had been a bit neglected and overlooked. So in that case, the innovation was really about taking something very complex and sophisticated and just making it much more engaging and simplistic and, 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 and user-friendly. So um, yeah, we built something you could click on in about a week. So it was a little simple prototype, tested it with a few people and then subsequently built the real thing and, and, and scaled it. And that's the kind of approach, this rapid um, bringing new products and services together. Yeah, absolutely. And Colin, tell me, I, I, I'm, what, I'm curious to ask you about how innovation and inclusion are sort of interconnected. So I'll give you a little bit, a bit of context, my friend. I work with uh, businesses and uh, organizations to help them sort of define their inclusive culture when it comes to infusing folks with uh, disabilities into a work culture. So how do you think we can use the prospect of innovation to spur a more inclusive atmosphere? Yeah, well, what all the research shows is that when you have a diverse team, and I'm talking not just about like ethnic and demographic, but also areas like class and even cognitive diversity. So maybe in this country, a lot of the big consultants is everyone went to a very similar school and they were all very middle class and they're much more white. Those people are not best placed always to solve the problems of either certain groups or come up with the most um, novel solutions. So that's one thing I'm really big at is when we build these teams, at most organizations these days, they're good at doing cross-functional, meaning you've got somebody from IT and marketing and whatever else, but they still, when it comes to innovation, you do sometimes have this kind of a group think, and it's these people designing for people that aren't always um, like them. So, you know, as an example, I used to work in an energy company, 
And we have a um, system in the UK where some people have to pay for their energy in advance called prepayment. And they're usually quite poor, so they're h- h- highly impoverished. And just the lack of empathy among some of the people working on that project. So they'd say things like, oh, well, why don't they just top up with like £100 in advance? Or why don't they just buy their energy online? And when you're dealing with particularly elderly poor people, they don't have £10, let alone £100. And similarly, a lot of them are disconnected from the internet. So you need people that have lived these kind of stories on the team. So I, I couldn't agree more. Diversity in every context is, is innovation's best friend. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about innovation, Tom, and I'm also wondering your thoughts on how we really get companies to think about adopting an innovative culture and how it can provi- provide their business with a competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, they say culture each strategy for breakfast, that it's particularly true with innovation. And, you know, I work with big organizations, and if you ask people, and I often do on a scale of one to 10, how innovative is your organization? The highest I've had ever is about a seven, and usually it's about a four or a five. And they say that rarely the problem is creativity. People are inherently creative. Usually it's these bureaucracies that have just kind of sucked the life out of people and they're built, these big organisations in particular, for efficiency. So it's about how do you become more entrepreneurial? And that really, it starts with, you know, having a really simplified process. So all of these companies, they build these very elaborate they call them stage gates. You've got to do all this stuff. So often we'll talk about, can you tell people a very simple process and some of the outputs, not out, sorry, the outcomes you want to achieve, not outputs? And can you give people creative freedom within some parameters? So if you said to me, Kevin, I've got this big idea, then I should be able to say to you, okay, well, you have a month or whatever time frame we set to go away and explore it. And this is what you need to achieve as an output. And if you do, I'll give you some more money and I'll give you some more freedom. And too many organizations, they kind of almost micromanage it over the, you know, over the top. They don't let the individual um, pursue their passion. So I think that's really innovation and passion are equally synonymous. So yeah, it's about enabling people to an extent to be able to trust their gut. They may be wrong in their, their pursuit, but it's about giving them some of that freedom. Yeah, absolutely. And Colin, I'm fascinated to ask you about how closely linked or or aligned do you think innovation and not being afraid to take chances and risk are are interaligned? Because I I think the two two are similarly linked. Would you agree with that? I couldn't agree more. And I mean, like a simple example, right, is are you afraid to say something that you're going to be laughed at or face ridicule? So there was one of the senior managers at Netflix and he asked in a crowded room, why are movies released in the cinema? And everybody looked at him as though he was an idiot, right? Well, of course they're released in the cinema. But when you think about it, there isn't a good reason, right? It's a really good question. Another thing you'll find about innovation is, sadly, most ideas fail, about 8 out of 10, depending on your industry. So the only way to innovate effectively is to have lots of ideas, and you almost need to accept failures part of it. But where you've got a culture where, and I've seen this happen so often, if you fail, you don't get your bonus, you don't get the promotion. Um, So you've got people doing these great work and taking risks, And then you've got the other side of the business where people are not doing innovation, playing it safe, and they are the ones that are getting rewarded. And as long as you allow that um, structure, you're signaling to people, we don't value innovation or it's overly risky. So organizations need to assess people based on, have they taken smart risk? Which really is, did they do some and learn valuable lessons from it, whether it was commercially successful or not? rather than purely did you hit some numbers, which in innovation, if you're doing cutting edge stuff, you know, it, it, it's inherent, it's almost impossible to guarantee you'll hit numbers. So organizations, big ones, they don't like variability and risk and they need to get more comfortable with it. Yeah, absolutely. And Tom, this is sort of a, a off the beaten path question, but since you're an innovative guy and you live in London and 
you know, one of the things that uh, King, King Charles talked about when he became king over there in London was the need to sort of innovate and make sure that the monarchy was more innovative. So what do you think about the approach to making the monarchy more innovative? And what steps do you think uh, people should look out for in that regard? Oh, that is a very a great question and what I wasn't expecting. Um, I think what the monarchy does really well is um, the kind of prestige. And, it, you know, it's a kind of revered institution and it's at a really elite brand. And it's how can it leverage that brand to help more people and more of the citizens. And I think it does that quite well in some of the charitable endeavours but maybe actually could it innovate to be more commercial. So the um, the Duchy of Cornwall, which is the prince, owns this big estate of land, which is a property, and they do farming and things. They sell some products and the money goes to charity. And I think there's a real opportunity to leverage some of his forward-thinking views around organic farming, around environmentalism, and really build that into a, a, a super brand I think the challenge is the royals always have a bit of a um, dilemma about making too much money or becoming too commercial because they're meant to be neutral. So that's the hard part for them to innovate. Lots of good ideas and opportunities, but they don't want to do a kind of a, I shouldn't say American, but they don't want to be a Donald Trump type character where he's trying to cash in on his fame. So it's can they do something tasteful, um, which is the, because the, there's no shortage of opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Colin, I'm also wondering your thoughts uh, on how will we look at maximizing innovation and elevating company culture and how they're interconnected. I know that you have uh, uh, previously answered similar, similar questions during our conversation today, but I'm curious, how do you think that you're linked in, in terms of creating a culture and maximizing innovation? So I keep, keep going back to this point. A lot of people, when you tell them eight out of, eight out of 10 ideas fail, they say, right, how can I reduce the failures? And I always say, there isn't really a way to reduce failing, but you can fail a lot faster earlier in the process. And the best way to do that is to get out of what I would call thought land. So thought land is we've had an idea, we build spreadsheets all based on assumptions, we endlessly discuss it internally and have lots of PowerPoints. And getting out to the real world and doing lots of kind of rapid, low-cost experiments to find out, does this idea have legs? So that's the best way, is the strongest proxy in a world is if you want to be good at innovation, you need to be good at lean experimentation. And it is quite a mindset shift because a lot of big organisations will say, yeah, we run experiments, but it takes them six months and they spend usually hundreds of thousands on it. I'm talking about what could you do in six days or two or three weeks maximum and spend a few hundred or a few thousand pounds on, you know, and it is stuff like you might, for example, if you've got an idea for a new service, buy some Google ads or some social media ads and just have a really simple web page. And then the first test is just, does anyone actually come to the web page? So even if the service doesn't exist, right, there are lots of ways you can simulate, are people going to buy this? Or if it's a retail context, it's things like setting up a pop-up store or going into one of your um, retail partners rather than developing really elaborate services. So, yeah, be more entrepreneurial and experimental is the best way to build a culture of innovation and be more successful at it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Colin, when I looked at the uh, prospect of, of talking to you uh, today, I was well, well, one uh, particular question I was fascinated to ask, so I'll ask it now. In terms of societal progress and making uh, progress towards inclusion and acceptance for all people, in terms of making uh, a progress on, on the conversation of inclusion, what do you think the role of innovation is when it comes to making uh, societal progress at large? I think it's got a huge role because sadly our track record on inclusion and equality which are linked has been quite poor. It's taken just, you know, 
far longer than it should. And you, you look at, I think you need to be quite evidence-led on what's worked and not. So controversial, I know in America, they've just um, got rid of some of the affirmative action stuff. But we look at, in this country, uh, in the political context, the Labour Party under Tony Blair were the first that made, their, they had what they called all women shortlists. And they solved the equality challenge. They were massively underrepresented by women, almost in one go by just mandating that. So that's one approach. But what are some of the other approaches? So if I look at, um, for example, in recruitment, which is a big issue because we, we instinctively and subconsciously recruit people like us. So similar def- demographic ethnicity and it's a subconscious bias. So can we have more, for example, blind recruitment where you don't see the CV or maybe even you don't meet the candidate, you just get to do some, I don't know, AI or remote interview. And then I love the example, there's um, the New York Opera and they used to have a problem of underrepresentation, and then they started getting people to audition behind a curtain. So all they did was hear your music. They didn't meet the person. And again, that solved the problem very quickly. You were finding, in their case, they discriminated against particularly short people because they thought they weren't powerful enough to play these big instruments. It turns out that was nonsense. So I think there's, um, yeah, novel ways of tackling this is 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 the is the way forward. Yeah, absolutely, and. You know, Colin, when we look at the prospect of uh, cultural diversity and its link to innovation, I, I, I think they're in, interlinked, as you, you've mentioned during our, our conversation today. But I'm curious to ask you, how do you think embracing cultural diversity can lead to better uh, uh, corporate or uh, company sort of innovation and really putting a stamp on adopting that as a full company uh, uh, objective or an organizational goal. So w- what do you see the role of cultural diversity playing when it, it, it comes to innovation? So I'll give you a really tangible example from this week. So we were doing some work for a big um, beauty brand. So they make all kinds of um, you know face care, body care products. And we're trying to think, how can we stimulate our thinking to innovate in new areas? And we brought over an inspirational speaker who's an expert in beauty from Asia. And they brought a big suitcase of products and also talked about some of the trends that were happening there. And there's a great saying from a sci-fi author, and he says, William Gibson, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And if I look in the case of beauty, the Asian market is just so much more innovative and advanced. And a lot of the innovation is about how can we learn and adopt and bring it. And if we hadn't had that Asian perspective in the UK context, we wouldn't have come up with come up lots of ideas drawn direct inspiration. So I think having people that have that different experience is critical. Or I mentioned before, when you're dealing with segments like um, underrepresented, so the, the payday lenders in this country, the, the only option historically for uh, uh, poor people, so those lacking funds, was to go to a loan shark. And then a lot of these companies emerged and not always the most ethical, but started offering short term loans on a simplified basis that banks had overlooked. And again, that's because you had this lack of diversity in financial services. Most bankers have grown up middle class and never faced the prospect of going to a loan shark. So getting people that have different lived experiences is absolutely critical to fuel an innovation and also can call out some of the BS as well. But when you get into these group think of agencies have all went to the same school and all worked in an agency for too many years. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Colin, I'm also wondering your, your perspective on the linkage between innovation and empowerment and how if you're really innovative, you can create a sense of uh, empowerment and belonging. So how do you think innovation and empowerment are interconnected and, uh, interconnected, and how can we use it as a strength as well? Yeah, and th- there's one of the big movements in recent years has been agile, and that's for project delivery, particularly innovation when you have complexity. And, 
what that was recognising is that the traditional approach to doing work in, in big organisations was what's called waterfall. And it was this idea that you could plan everything in advance and the people who were most senior were the smartest people and should really make the decisions. And this new method, Agile, has come along and it's flipped it on its head. And what it's saying is that the people who are closest to the action, who are doing the work day to day, they're probably best placed in this new complex world to make those decisions. So the role of a leader is no longer to supervise and criticise. It's actually to serve and say, right, how can I actually enable you? So if you want to be innovative, the critical thing is that you're able to move at speed. You're able to iterate and change as you learn things because it's like that Mike Tyson quote, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. So there's a plan for innovating. Then as soon as you execute, you'll find out things you didn't expect. And the problem is if you don't empower your teams, and so many aren't, they can't adapt quickly enough and build what the customer wants. So empowerment is absolutely critical and sadly lacking very often. people, Everyone talks about empowerment, but empowerment really comes down to can I make financial decisions and can I redirect people and resources? That's how you know if you're empowered, not a lot of flowery words. Yeah, absolutely. And- Colin, throughout the course of your career, I'm wondering, when you look back on it or look forward, what do you think is the best lesson you've learned about the power of innovation? And what do you think, moving forward, innovation will evolve to over the course of time? Oh, it's it's a good question. I think the, the real thing is, one of the other keys to successful innovation is that people really buy into it. And I always remember we worked with um, the Irish Postal Service years ago on post, and that was a business in trouble for obvious reasons. So mail volumes were falling through the floor. They were having to lay off a lot of staff. And they said, look, it's innovate or die. So we actually had permission there to be really bold and breakthrough. Whereas I've had lots of other briefs where, to be honest, people much as everyone's conditioned to say innovation is really important, but they didn't really believe it in their heart. They were still making money. So innovation was, a, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try our best. So it's by the time you realize you're in trouble, it's often too late. And the, the famous example is Kodak. So it was highly profitable. They had a guy internally who came up with this digital camera idea and they said, no, no, it'll kill our own business. So my greatest lesson is, if you don't disrupt or try and kill your existing business, someone else will. And there's still a real reluctance time after time when we try and be really bold and people say it's not the right time, you know, it's too risky. And almost always in the medium or long term, they end up regretting the, the restraint. So it's yet yeah, to be bold and, and move before, you, before you're dead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, In terms of being bold and being innovative, what do you say about uh, the people who would come up to you and say, "Uh, Colin, I really want to be innovative, but I'm afraid to take the leap because I'm comfortable in my comfort zone. So tell me about breaking down those barriers towards the prospect of innovation and how important it is to really push yourself outside of your comfort zone um, when it comes to uh, innovation. How important is it to push yourself out of your comfort zone? Yeah, it's scary. And, you know, not just for internal reasons. I mean, if you take a big risk and put your head above the parapet, you can get fired, right? Or you can lose prestige and stuff. So I think the best advice, it's kind of that, how do you eat an elephant? And innovation is really huge and complex. But if you shrink it down to thinking about, okay, I'm in the early stages, I'm currently, how do I come up with a good idea? Then you can focus on creativity, brainstorming, or how do I bring that idea to life? So that that's how I'd encourage people to approach innovation, is just think, what stage am I at? And just break it into small little chunks and try and do it not alone. Innovation is very much a team sport. And I've made the mistake in my career of coming up with great ideas on my own, developing them for a long time, and then almost doing the dara moment and surprising people. And it never works. You need to bring your colleagues or your investors or whoever 
along with you on a journey. So identify the problem is the most important thing because if you get that wrong, you won't get anything else right. So usually that is there's a customer, whether it's a consumer or a business to business or someone internally, what is a problem you're trying to solve for them? Get alignment on the problem. And from there on, you can start developing ideas and the rest of the stuff you can you can iterate and upskill in over time. Yeah, absolutely. And Connor, when you look at your life to this point, my friend, I, I'm curious, what would you define as your defining moment of difference? And when we look at celebrating life, life you know, I'm a, a big believer of celebrating wins in life, no matter how big or how small they are. So when we look at your own personal and professional life, how do you celebrate the wins? And when uh, we talk about your defining moment of difference, what would you classify that as as well? You know, I'm going to give you a really un PC answer, which is um, when we do something great, and usually I, I, I take personal joy from it in an individual level. So if you've helped a client and they might be working in not the most glamorous industry. So for example, the printing industry or I mentioned cybersecurity, I think it's actually often going out for a celebration, whether it's a dinner, whether it's drinks, um, looking back over the work and really taking time to reflect on the milestone because innovation is a really long process. So if you wait till the very end, it might be two years or more. So it's to say to them, actually, we've done a great job on building this concept or running this prototype. Let's go out and celebrate and then let's recognize people. And, you know, sometimes that can be with like kind of fun awards or something, or sometimes giving them a prize or just even a kind of pat on the back. But I think you want to punctuate you know, the everyday with these memorable things. So I'm a big fan of a really nice dinner, drinks, that kind of thing, and connecting and celebrating on, on a human level rather than, you know, just at an intellectual or insular level. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, Colin, I'm also curious to ask you, uh, coming out of COVID, how do you think innovation can help us redefine the new definition of doing business more efficiently. So how do you think we can use innovation to conduct business more efficiently? And outside of coming out of the pandemic, do you think there is a new new definition to doing business? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And most noticeably, it's obviously in remote working. I remember pre-COVID once having to travel from London to Washington, D.C. for a half-day meeting. So I had to fly all the way over and then immediately back. And it really wasn't necessary, right? And now, at the time, the client would not have contemplated doing it virtually. And now they wouldn't contemplate me flying over for, for the waste of time. So I think it's effective collaboration and there are some great tools like the virtual whiteboard so Miro and Mural that people are using and are getting more sophisticated I think obviously video conferencing um, as well and also the, the other one I call out just in collaboration is is Loom so I hate getting very long complex emails but if you can record your screen and show me you talking briefly which is what this tool does I think that just can shrink the world. And it's great if you're in different time zones and you were talking earlier about uh, cultural diversity. Well, if I want to work with a bunch of developers in India, it's never been easier, even if they're on a different time zone, because we have these great asynchronous um, tools. I think the other um, thing that's happened post-COVID as well is obviously the emergence of AI is just absolutely huge and it's in its infancy. So I think right now, a lot of individuals are using it and many organizations maybe don't know that they're using it. We often use it to write outlines or if we're naming products to develop, develop lots of options. So I think that is going to do a lot of the kind of, I'll call it grunt work or at least predictable work. And then the, the value you add as a consultant or as an innovator is going to be more around galvanizing people and prioritizing and strategizing versus maybe doing as much of the creating slides or even some of the artificial intelligence around financial modeling now, the sophistication is just growing exponentially. So that's something I'm excited about. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Carl, I'm also wondering your thoughts on, you know, innovation's place in sort of 
helping people think uh, outside of you know the the normal way of of doing the Monday tax. You know, yeah. so some people may be watching this and say, "In Colin, innovation is great, but it may take away from." Um, physically giving people work to do and, and showing them outside of the workforce. So I want you to play devil's advocate and tell me why people should embrace innovation when doing their work. And do you think the advancement of innovation will eventually uh, reduce the need for manual manpower? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and I worry about it as well because there is a danger it can lead to mass redundancy. I think on an optimistic note, if you look through history, whenever there's been a big technological change, people have migrated to new types of work. So if we're going to have um, or higher value work, so I think in the case of something like medicine, AI will almost certainly take over the reading of most scans. There may still be some human intervention, but by freeing up the um, radiologist's time and studying all those scans, it means maybe hopefully they can spend more time actually with patients or redirect to other areas. Um, innovation as well. I know a lot of people who work very long days, 10, 12 hours. I mean, again, maybe optimistically, I'm thinking innovation won't replace them. But if it can give them a 20, 30 percent saving, maybe that means they can start work at an eight hour day rather than a, a 12 hour day. So it's at its augments existing, uh, existing people. But on a more fatalistic note, regardless of where you are, I remember Jeff Bezos been said, you know, Amazon's destroyed the book industry. And he said, no, the Internet's destroyed the book industry. So this stuff, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle, rightly or wrongly, sadly. I know people talk about regulation, but if the US regulates, China won't or other countries won't. So you kind of have to embrace it. And you have to think, I guess, quite selfishly, how do you bulletproof your career? So if you don't embrace this technology, you're the one who's going to suffer. So I think you have to be a little bit um, self-interested as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Colin, I'm, uh, as our time uh, today comes to an end, I I'm curious to ask you about your upbringing, my friend, because I know uh, you're over there in London and, and uh, talking to you for uh, the length of time that I have. I can see that you're a proud Englishman, my friend, and you live over there in London. So tell me about uh, how you grew up and how it's still influences the work that you do today. Yeah, well, I'm a Scotsman, but English, but I'll take <laughs> Scottish. Um, you know, I grew up in, I guess, quite a deprived area, so I don't think I had the most traditional education. And then, bizarrely, I worked in an energy company for the first seven years of my uh, career, which was very traditional and very hierarchical and not very innovative. So, I came from a background atypical for most people in this field. And I keep saying innovation for me and another way of saying it's about empathy. So I think particularly when I'm helping big organizations to get stuff done, having had those experiences and being in a big energy company that was difficult, I think I can help them build those through some of those kind of corporate blockers. And then again, from my own, from my own upbringing, I think um grown up in a in a deprived area, I've got good empathy with, you know, frankly, normal people, or you might want to say working class people as well, which again, a lot of people in my profession, they grew up quite middle class, to be honest, and um maybe don't have the empathy for if money's short, um, if the education level isn't where it, where it could be, people that have smaller homes or other types of problems. So I think that's, that does give you an edge and a different lens that continues through. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Colin, my final question for you today has to do with your own personal and professional legacy and how you want that to be defined. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a big question. Well, I'd love to say that we're going to invent the new iPhone, but 
you know, I've been a small company. Maybe, maybe we will, but maybe we won't. But I think what gives me joy and legacy is, as I mentioned earlier, when we have an impact on individual clients. So one of the other thing we do is innovation coaching. And that's probably the most tangible form when you take someone and you would coach them sometimes for three months or six months and they get that individual promotion. Or even we coach them and they decide that they want to go into a new role or even a new company and they you, you positively changed their life. Um, you know, so those are the ones that I remember most strongly is when you've helped someone else. I think helping a big company to make more money, it, you know, that's great. That's what we do as well. But I, I take more joy from helping the individual achieve what they're, they're seeking to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, Colin, tell me if people want to get connected with you, what's the best way they can do that? Oh, so if you just Google Mosaic Innovation or Mosaic hyphen Innovation, and there's a download button there where we've got loads of toolkits and resources. So every part of the innovation process, so if you're looking to get started, whether it's creativity, whether it is experimentation or customer experience, there's a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides that you can actually run your own workshops and sessions with. So even if you know nothing about innovation, check it out and get in touch if you want any more help and love talking to new people. Absolutely. Well, Colin, I, I'm uh, grateful that we had a chance to cross paths today to talk all about innovation, its future, and how it's changing the world, my friend. Your work in the space and time on my behalf is most appreciated. I want to wish you a great day and thank you for being here. It's most appreciated. It was my pleasure, Kevin. Really nice to meet you and I look forward to staying in touch.